Hi, my name is Christopher Michael Stewart, um, and I'm going to be presenting today on data science, human language technology, and natural language processing. Um, Okay, so just a little bit about me. Uh, I did a PhD in French linguistics at the University of Illinois, then worked for a few years as an assistant professor of French linguistics at the University of Texas at Arlington in the modern languages department. Um, I then left uh, that job and worked as a voice engineer um, in the text-to-speech research and development um, division at Nuance, which is now called Serence in Belgium. And while I was there, I developed Siri, the Siri voices, um, took on a major tech face, a major customer facing role, um, and had uh, a lot of um, good beer in Belgium. Uh, then I left that job and got a, two jobs as a senior data scientist. First, I worked at uh, Tata Consultancy Services in, um, in Arkansas, developing a machine learning pipeline for Walmart and then worked at a tiny startup uh, called Narrative Wave, uh, doing time series modeling of industrial Internet of Things data. I now work at Google as a computational linguist, um, and my team works on detecting policy violations at scale, best practices for crowdsourcing tasks, and I build automated data quality reports. Before I go much further, I'll mention that I am not speaking on behalf of Google here. I'm only uh, talking about my experience and, and background. Um, okay, so I've, I've set myself up the impossible task of in 45 minutes talking about data science, human language technology, and natural language processing. Each one of these is an entire career's worth of information, and there's no way I could possibly do much justice to all three of these fields in 45 minutes. So what I've aimed to do then is hit the sweet spot between these three fields. So what do these have in common? And um, there, I'm going to tell you that what I think that they have in common is something that I'm here calling predicted probability. So these are all uh, fields that are um, uh, all about modeling, statistical modeling, and in particular machine learning, um, and trying to trying to figure out something about uh, make some sort of inference about the future and use data uh, to predict that. So what does that look like? So here's, I have predicted probability and, and then ML, so machine learning or deep learning deal and really more deep learning than machine learning. So under that, I put the, the short names for these that I'm going to be using DS, HLT and NLP. And I put um, some examples of what's called conditional probabilities. So a, a probability is denoted by P open parentheses, the probability of some event, right? So the probability of a fair, um, of a fair coin coming up heads is 0.5. But you can also condition probabilities on things. So in data science, if you're working as a data scientist at, for instance, at Tesla or somewhere like that, you might be interested in predicting what is the probability that an object going uh, that's, that appears in front of a car will be a human. So you're, you know, it's, it's a predicted, so will be a human, and it's probabilistic. What is the probability this object is a human? given data coming from thousands of sensors, historical data, metadata, all sorts of stuff, right? Um, human, and if you're working in human language technology and you're working for a text-to-speech synthesis team, you might have a whole bunch of segments, a whole bunch of cut up vowels and consonants and you know, things like that. And you'll be interested in predicting what is the probability that a segment is good for a text-to-speech synthesis context, given a, a, a language model's spectral specifications, duration, uh, focus, you know, narrow or broad focus, uh, part of speech, etc. If you work in NLP, you might be interested in predicting what is the probability that a tweet, a tweet will have hate speech, given metadata about the tweet, uh, the, the actual content, the language in the tweet, the time it was tweeted, the place it was tweeted, who retweeted it, how many retweets did they get, all this sort of information. So this is this is the sort of world that you will live in. and. Um, so I'm going to start this talk uh, talking about probability and predicted probability in machine learning, and this is probably very different from the other talks that you've been that you've been to because I'm really going to start by the part that you might not know very much about and work back in the second half of the talk to a, an actual language context. But we're going to start with predicted with with talking about probability and machine learning and things like that. 
So if you don't like that, I'm sorry, but it is the common thread here amongst these three uh, subject areas. So before I start though, before I go too in depth here, I just wanna emphasize that if you have never taken statistics or have no idea what machine learning is or are afraid of equations or you know whatever the case may be, don't worry, just try and sort of absorb the ideas here. So like for instance, this conditional probability event, you can imagine what is the probability that's gonna rain on, in, on Friday, this coming Friday, right? You might have some sort of naive probability, but if I tell you that it's Monday, you might have a very different prediction than if I tell you it's Thursday. Closer to the time, we have a better idea of what's gonna happen, right? So just try and engage with the ideas, even if it's you know sort of foreign and seems odd or, or hard to get, just try and get some of the ideas. Don't worry if you don't get all of the, the particulars. Okay, um, think to yourself, have you ever taken a class in statistics? I can only see a few people. Raise your hand if you have a statistics class. Okay, okay. if you haven't had a statistics class, no worries, not a problem. Um, but the, the interesting part for, for our purposes about, um, about statistical modeling is that, so statistical modeling is when you take a set of data and you try and build a model to do something. And you know the famous quote, all models are wrong, but some are useful. So the point is to try and, and, and figure out something with this model, right? Um, typically in social sciences, we build models, we collect data, right? Language data in, in this case, for instance, um, and we build a statistical model, mathematical model of that, of that data. And we assume that this model tells us something about what is going on in the data. So for instance, if you have a regression model, you, you will have um, parameters in your regression model and it, it will tell you something about what, you know, what, what is the, how predictive uh, uh, is, um, you know, someone's language background of the language that they use or, you know, something like that. So we assume that these models reflect some sort of underlying process. Because of that, we're very interested in the parameters. The parameters are the important parts. That's the, 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 the interesting parts about the model. Like, you know, does someone's um, age tell you more than their um, L2 or, you know, whatever about some sort of linguistic behavior? Um, because we're interested in parameters, we're, we prefer simpler models in this uh, statistical uh, modeling culture. Um, and this is prevalent in causal research, but not so much in engineering. I forgot to mention that this, I'm taking this from a paper by a statistician named Leo Brayman called Statistical Modeling the Two Cultures. And it's, it's helpful for um, seeing how these two cultures differ. So that's data modeling. If you've taken uh, introduction to statistics, you've talked about things like this, about t-tests and ANOVAs and regressions and logistic regressions and all that sort of stuff, right? So there is a different culture of statistical modeling that Leo Brayman in this paper calls al algorithmic modeling. In algorithmic modeling, we do not assume that the, the model that we build reflects some sort of underlying process. There's no assumption that what comes out of the model tells you about reality. We're not really interested in that. What we're interested instead in is prediction. We're interested in predicting what's, what's going to happen uh, with this data that we have from the past. Um, because of this, we don't really care about uh, the model being simple. Uh, because we're not really interested in what's going on in the model all the time. We're more interested in, in, in prediction. Um, so not afraid of black box models, models that we don't really know what's going on necessarily in, in every tiny little part of the model. Um, this needs lots of training data and uh, lots of computational power typically. Now there is, if you've never heard of this algorithmic modeling sort of world and deep learning and machine learning and all that sorts of stuff, but you have taken a statistics class, there is an intermediate between these two. It's a field called statistical learning. Um, and there is a, a book written by uh, Hasty and Tipshirani called Introduction to Statistical Learning that I really recommend here if you've never read it or don't have any familiarity with it. Okay. okay, so let's talk a little bit about machine learning. So machine learning, great buzzword, what does it mean? Um, so in, tra in traditional programming, you take input, you make a program and you get results. So for instance, um, in a, a popular coding problem, um, is to say, I'm, write a function where you give this function input, a number, and if the number is divisible by five, you output fizz, and if the number is divisible by seven, you output buzz or something like that. So you have input, an integer, a program, this thing that says, you know, is this number divisible by five? Is this number divisible by seven? And output something, it does something. Machine learning is a little bit different because we take input and results and we put them into a machine learning model 
and what comes out of it is something like a program. So this is in this and this it's important to note that this has nothing to do with language. You could be this is basic binary classification. So you could be looking to classify, uh, you know, this is in this I have like this funny sort of toy example of is this a chihuahua or a muffin. Um, but you know, you could be looking to like predict is it going to rain or is it not going to rain. Um, is this person likely to be likely to click on this link or not click on this link or whatever, any sort of binary classification. So for the purposes of, of this uh, little demonstration, we're gonna talk about this funny toy problem um, in visual uh, binary classification, which is, is this picture a chihuahua or a muffin? Which I took this picture from an article where you can see that actually chihuahuas and muffins are not always that easy to um, disambiguate, uh, which is kind of scary. Um, so if we want to build a classifier with this, what will we do? Well, we need labeled data. So we need an image one, an image two, an image three, an image four, where we, where we indicate, is this thing actually a dog or a muffin or a muffin or a dog or whatever? And we put that into a model and the program that comes out of it, we'll just call it for now dog or muffin. So we build a classifier and then we use it. So we start with these, this what's called training data in these four instances here, image one, two, three, and four. And we put a new, a new, an unseen uh, image into this and use the classifier. So tell me what I asked the classifier, I mean, not literally, but we have the classifier predict, is this a dog or a muffin? And then, for instance, in one case, it could say, I, I'm 95% sure that this is a dog, right? Um, we look at the expected results. So if we, if we um, put another image, image six in, it says, look, I'm 55% sure. So not really all that sure, but 55% sure that this is a dog. And we look at the expected results. Oh, it's a muffin. So I wasn't real, the, the, the model wasn't real confident that it was a, a dog. And, and that's good because it wasn't a dog, it was a muffin. So we can do this over and over again. Image seven, image eight, image seven, 64% chance that it's a dog. Image eight, 92% chance that it's a muffin. Uh, we're wrong with uh, image seven and we're right with image eight. Um, and you can go through this over and over and over again. Um, this is called reinforcement. So th this is kind of the basic intuition behind how this works. And you can see that what we're interested in here is predicting. So I don't really care what's going on in dog or muffin. I don't really care that the model is looking for ears uh, in an image or um, you know, uh, how bright or dark the image is or whatever. It doesn't really matter. I'm, I'm really interested in, in how accurate the model is at predicting whether the image is a dog or a muffin. So in, just to reiterate, first of all, uh, trigger warning, the next slide does have equations. So if you're scared of betas and Xs and Ys and things like that, and, and Greek letters of all sorts, avert your eyes on the next slide. So in the data modeling culture, we're most interested in understanding what the model tells us about the data generating process. So if you, if you collect data about language usage, you will uh, put into this model a whole bunch of information that you think helps you understand what's going on. Right. So you're interested in, in, in the data gem, generating process. All data goes in the model and you're not really concerned with prediction. If you go to publish an article, uh, the editors are never going to come to you and say, hey, look, I found this other this speaker that you didn't talk to who has these characteristics. Please put those characteristics in the model and tell me how predictive they are of this person. And I'll tell you if you got it right or wrong. That will never happen because this, that's really not the point. Right. You're really interested in what's going on in the in the um, in the data generating process. So in algorithmic, uh, the algorithmic modeling culture, we're primarily concerned with prediction. So your priorities change. Um, so in this, in this sort of world, some data could help you uh, make better predictions and some data could in fact help you make worse predictions. Um, you can end up in instances where you have uh, not very many observations, but millions and millions and millions of variables like genetic arrays and genetic testing is a good instance of this. Sometimes you only have a few samples of a gene, but you know you have as many, um, I don't really know that much about genetics, but as many of the little uh, um, you know, pairs or whatever of, of gene doodads, uh, it's, sorry, it's a long, it's, a, it's late in the day. I'm, I'm not very eloquent here, but you get my point. So sometimes you have more observations than uh, more variables than you do observations. And that might uh, be a problem for your model. So what might you wanna do? Well, if you were one of the person, one of the people who earlier said that they had had introduction to an introduction to a statistical modeling class, you will be familiar with this data modeling equation: y equals beta naught plus beta one x one beta two x two, beta all the way to beta p x p. And if you've never seen this, and this looks confusing and crazy, don't worry about it. Imagine that you want to predict 
height given weight, right? You, if you have, you'll have uh, an X and a Y axis on the X axis might be height and the Y axis might be weight or vice versa, it doesn't really matter. And you would have a whole bunch of points there, right? And I tell you, hey, look, I want you to uh, predict a new person that you haven't seen given height and weight. And I'm gonna put you know, this one point in here on the, y, on the Y axis. And I want you to tell me what the X axis will be. Well, that's what you have here, right? You have the Y is the, the thing that you wanna predict. The X's are the things that you, uh, that you already know. Um, and the betas are the weights on those things. And what you wanna do, obviously, if, is you wanna draw a line that minimizes the distance between all those points and that line, right? It's called the line of best fit. So that's what this minimizing RSS, you wanna minimize the residual sum of squares. Now, let's say that you have so much data that you actually have a problem because some of those X's are not very useful. So you want to be able to adjust these betas, right? It's very simple, this, this whole thing is the exact same. This is machine learning. This is called ridge regression. Um, this, the, 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 the equation is the exact same, except for you add this little penalty term here at the end that says, look, don't let, don't let my, um, my uh, betas get too, my squared betas get too big. And this, this lambda parameter is upside down y allows you to sort of turn a volume knob on all these betas, right? And so it's very simple. It's a very simple uh, thing. And that, that has then taken you from statistical modeling, sort of the, the data modeling world to machine learning, okay? Now, uh, obviously that's not really the state of the art. The state of the art is something more like much more complicated algorithmic modeling. Here you have like a basic uh, neural network and this is what the state of the art is. So this is what the people who um, actually, you know, sort of build these production models at uh, big companies. This is what they do, um, which is, you know, it, it's just a one iteration, a slight bit more complicated. But my, what I'm trying to impart here is that this, um, you, can, you can start it if you understand uh, ordinary least squares regression, this top equation, you can easily go to statistical learning, which is this next one, just by understanding what's going on in the model. And then once you understand that with a little bit more work, you can go to this algorithmic modeling uh, world. So the, the, the intuitions here, again, are very simple. You can have a very, a model that doesn't do a good job of predicting. It's just make, kind of makes random predictions, right? Or you can have a model that's very in tune to this training data that really understands the, 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 um, all of those uh, uh, chihuahua and muffin pictures that we showed to it. But um, if I show a new picture, it doesn't know. It has no idea if it's a, a chihuahua or a muffin. So you want some sort of sweet spot where you're not making completely random predictions, but your predictions aren't so, so closely tuned to that training data that it doesn't generalize. So you want to you find this minimum error here. And that's, this is referred to as the bias variance trade-off. So wrapping up our discussion of machine learning here, how effective is modern machine learning? Well, deep learning, uh, yeah, there, I put a few links here. You're welcome to copy them down and find the articles. Um, it's not always great. I mean, as you probably have, have experienced in, in life, uh, but, but it is quite good. There's a massive need for labeled data um, and who labels this data and how do we ensure that their labels are good? Well. Now we're getting to our world. Linguists are actually pretty good at getting data from humans, right? And so linguists often work on this in industry. Okay, so this is this is you know maybe more than you have sort of uh, taken on in in your explorations of statistics. So how can you start learning about machine learning? Well, the important thing is to remember that all approaches, even the most complex uh, deep mind model that you can possibly imagine, has x's and y's. It has things you want to predict and things you already know. It has weights that go on the X's that predict the Y's and it has error. The model is wrong and you want to quantify how wrong the model is. So if you want, remember that all of these approaches have these ingredients. Uh, if you want to start learning about machine learning, you can develop some, in, uh, develop some statistical intuitions. Remember that, that basic inferential statistics will serve you well uh, going forward. Do your own analyses as much as possible. Make sure that you understand ideas like statistical assumptions, normality, a normality tests, model assessment. Don't just go to uh, Stack Overflow and enter in some R code that someone tells you builds a linear mixed effects model. It's not that that will not serve you well. Uh, read an introduction to statistical learning if you want to go beyond inferential statistics. 
If you're already there and you're looking for something more complex, uh, find data, Bayesian data analysis. And if you want more complex than that, then you're in the wrong place because this talk is not for you. Um, okay, so that was the part about machine learning. Thank you for sticking with me through statistics. Let's talk now about, uh, about natural language processing. So we're, now we're gonna turn to language. So how are these, modern uh, these machine learning models used in natural language processing? So this section is just a brief peek into the kinds of consideration that go into an NLP pipeline. This is not state-of-the-art NLP. This is like, uh, you know, if you want to learn Python and you start and they say, okay, you know, define a variable that's a string and now capitalize the string or, you know, whatever, that's kind of this equivalent. So I'm not, I'm not proposing to you that this is like state-of-the-art incredible NLP, you know, knowing these things is not going to get you a job, but it, it is a, a peek into this world. Okay, so what what is involved in natural language processing? So this is just a sample sort of pipeline, um, uh, things you might want to do if you uh, were building a natural language pipeline uh, with two sentences. Moscow has also, Moscow also denounced what it described as the rise of quote, nationalist and neo-fascist sentiment in Ukraine's Western areas where it said Russian speakers were being deprived of rights. It has repeatedly expressed concern for the safety of Russian citizens in Ukraine. So the first thing that we might be interested in here is defining uh, a sentence boundaries, right? Um, the sentence boundary, you could, a very naive approach would be to say, anytime you see a period, that that's the end of a sentence, that's gonna be problematic, right? Because if we have something like um, uh, uh, AD, I don't know, some sort of an abbreviation or USA or something like that, um, you could have periods that are not sentence boundaries. So again, you're, you're going to need to train a probabilistic model that tries to predict when sentence boundaries are, and you know sometimes will be right and sometimes will be wrong. Okay, and the next thing you might want to do is to divide all this this sentence up into tokens. Now, what are tokens? Tokens are something like words, um, but importantly, they may not always align with what you think of as a word boundary. So, for instance, one one interesting thing that I see uh, right away here is this Ukraine. So Ukraine apostrophe S, most people would say that's, that's a word, right? But for the purposes of tokenization, we might be interested in saying that this apostrophe S, which indicates possession, is a separate token. Okay, so there's, again, this is something that you're gonna have to uh, model probabilistically. Um, after this part of speech tagging, um, I think part of speech tagging, I have a speaker note here, but I can't see it, but I think part of speech tacking the state of the art in, in English is something like 98% correct, 90% accurate. So again, this is uh, an, an instance where you would build a model and, and probabilistically predict what these parts of speech are. Um, syntactic parsing, I'm sorry if you're a syntactician, but this is, I'm just gonna skip over this in the interest of time uh, and move on to entity detection. So um, going, so I've started at, at sort of a, a very low level tokenization then part of speech tagging going up further, syntactic parsing, parsing and then even further up than that to entity detection. So you can see that um, you want to be able to model the fact that some of these are sort of related to each other, right? So Moscow and it have some sort of uh, relationship, um, et cetera. Um, so this is called entity detection or na uh, named entity recognition. You might want to cluster them, right? So that Mos Moscow and it are clustered, what and rise, uh, Ukraine, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So these are just the kinds of considerations that you would want to take into account if you're going to um, model, if you're going to have a, a, um, a computational representation of what's going on in these two sentences. So again, all of these are predicted using deep learning models in state-of-the-art natural language processing. And um, if you're interested in deep learning models, Remember this guy at the bottom here, that's a, 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 a visual representation of a deep learning model. Um, uh, this and subsequent steps are typically implemented by research scientists and computer engineers. It's not often the case that linguists, uh, because we are not really trained in you know, math and, and computer science and things like that, are writing these models from scratch. Um, and anymore, a lot of, a lot of this and it used to be the case that um, hyperparameter tuning and things like that, you had to do by hand, but increasingly even that is, uh, is, is uh, solved by the computer uh, by just grid search and things like that. Um, linguists therefore contribute domain knowledge to identify rules and identify areas for improvement. 
uh, linguists have a lot of, uh, obviously a lot of experience um, with you know, what language should look like. And so when the model gets something wrong, are pretty good at saying, hey, I think that this is what the problem is. Um, and once you have enough of those, you can identify rules, right? You can say, hey, look, it looks like the model is not great at um, dealing with possessives or you know, whatever the, the case may be. Um, and to provide, uh, and linguists also work to provide annotated data that train these automated processes. Um, so you might think, oh, wow, this is all pretty impressive. So NLP is pretty much is what people call a solved problem, right? Well, not necessarily. Uh, you probably recognize that you know a lot of um, uh, a lot of machine learning can kind of go wrong and do wonky things. And um, the other day, I was working on something and tried to get some sort of uh, digital personal assistant to play a song, and I said the name the name of the song in Spanish. So like, um, please play the song "Voy a perder la cabeza por tu amor" or something like that. And to the, the thing, and it says here's what that is in Spanish or whatever, and then just translated whatever I said into Spanish. So why didn't it get it right? Well, there are some things that are pretty challenging for natural language processing. So um, let's consider this passage really quickly. The police arrested Mayor John Smith yesterday. He was suspected of stealing garden gnomes, the latest breach in a, cre in a crime wave rocking the sleepy town of Springfield. So if we think about abstract representations of these sentences, um, you can start to see that there are things that are, are a little bit difficult, right? So those things look like this. Um, the fact that we have co-reference, co right, to entities, so like Mayor John Smith and he. Um, uh, the police are tied to this, uh, the town of Springfield. Uh, we have, uh, if we look at it, this sentence ontologically, um, how do we want to represent something like Mayor John Smith? Is this an instance of a mayor whose name is John Smith, or should uh, it'd be John Smith and his occupation as mayor. What is the, the sort of preferable um, representation here uh, in terms of salience? Um, we have these event relations. So uh, the fact that we know as humans and, and, and um, language users that suspected comes before arrested. Normally someone is suspected of something and then they're arrested, right? But a computer doesn't know that. You have to, you have to sort of engineer that. Um, these are inferences that require uh, real world knowledge of criminal processes. Um, also, the fact that there, there is something like subjectivity, right? That someone can be a, suspected of something, that's sort of a subjective call. That's a subjective uh, um, consideration, right? And, you know, we, we understand that, but computers don't really understand that. Um, ditto uh, or idem for um, things like a crime wave that rocks. You know, how do, how do we represent the fact that this is all, this is metaphorical usage and that the town of Springfield is not actually sleepy. Like it doesn't, it's not that it wants to take a nap. It's a way of saying that a town is calm and, you know, sort of bucolic. Um, ditto for metonymy. Um, so yeah, these are challenges for, for, for modern natural language processing. Okay, so starting to wrap up here. Um, so this has all been a lot of information. I'm sorry to, to sort of, uh, I've, I've gone through it relatively quickly. I don't know if we do questions. Is there a question period? Does anyone know? I'm not done with these yet, um, but I guess we'll see at the end of this. Uh, I, I think there is, right? Cause you guys can put questions in the chat, hopefully. In any case, I'm happy to go back through uh, parts that might've been a little tough, but let's talk just briefly before that about um, what you can start doing now. So. Let's say you're in a master's program and you think, oh, this NLP stuff seems kind of cool. You know, I've, I've taken an introduction to Python and, um, and I took uh, Statistics 101 or whatever. What, what should I do next? Um, this should be yourself, sorry. Uh, so the first thing is learn, you're gonna have to do a lot of independent learning. So there's, this is not the sort of thing where um, you turn up and you know, someone gives you a job and you know, immediately you have a job for 50. There's a lot of sort of, you have to, invest a lot of your own time into learning things here. So learn how you learn best. That's the first step. Um, you know, a lot, I, I was in the um, uh, office hours the other day and, and, you know, several people said, hey, you know, I, I'm, I took, I, I'm taking an introduction to Python and I'm sort of interested, but it's boring and it's hard to stick to. And uh, I just don't really like it that much. And my advice was, hey, well, then find a project, you know, figure out some sort of project that you're actually interested in. Like I'm, interested in, um, uh, 
I don't know, like I, I studied Georgian or something and it has this very interesting syntactic property and I'm inter I want to build something that can predict that or I want to, to suggest a better way for um, my favorite uh, software package that handles Georgian to better model, you know, whatever it is. Um, find a project and contribute to that project. A lot of natural language processing software is open source. So you can, you can find the people that develop it, take the code, it's called forking the code. So you just make a copy of the code, look at it, change the part that you want and send the change back to the person who develops the code. That's called uh, a pull request and say, look, I really admire your work and, and think it's very cool, um, but I find some, I've found something that I think can be improved. Please take a look and, and see what you think. Um, how do you measure progress? And, you know, learn, you're going to have to present what you've done in the past and what you want to do in the future and sort of give some sort of indication of, uh, of the pro progress that you've made on your various projects. And that's going to be extremely important when you go into industry. Um, this works really well for technical skills, right? You can say, um, I've taken intermediate Python and I, uh, I have, you know, this change, this change, and this change that I made to the natural language toolkit package um, that are now in production or you know, whatever. So it works really well for technical skills. Um, next, do side projects. So find problems, like I mentioned, and fix them. Um, you know, it's not always the most glamorous and interesting work, but guess what? It's what you're gonna be doing if you get a job in one of these fields. Uh, and, and so yeah, find a problem and fix it. Um, there's paid work. So um, big tech companies, for instance, hire paid interns every summer. Um, and there's volunteer work. I mean, you know, what I said about working on uh, something like NLTK, that's, that's free. I mean, I mean, you don't, you know, you, you sacrifice your time, but you get something out of it, you get experience. Um, maybe the most important of all of these things is to keep records of what you did. It's nice to tell people, I know about statistics and I know about programming and I know about this, and I know about that but it's much more convincing if you can point to things you actually did. And if you want to be able to point to things you actually did, the way that you would do that is you make a web page, right? A, a personal web page. You make a, um, what's called a repository, a code repository, and you point from your web page to the repository. And the repository has project one, project two, project three, project four, project five. And the web page does a beautiful job of explaining, here's what project one does. Here's what project two does. Here's what project three does. And for each one of those projects, you can point to all the code that you wrote to do the project. So you really want to be able to prove uh, you know, that you, you have whatever kinds of experience that you have. So it's really important to keep records. Really, really, really important to keep records. Um, next, find chances to use new tools. Um, be sophisticated about data. So this goes back to the slide where I said, look, make sure you understand the models that you're building. A lot of people build statistical models and have no idea what they mean. Don't be one of those people. Be sophisticated about data. Apply for an internship. Like I said, there are a lot of companies in tech that hire uh, interns to do um, you know, things like text to speech synthesis and automatic speech recognition and natural language processing and all sorts of stuff like that. Um, so apply for an internship. Automate your drudge work. So you, uh, you know, is it the case that you are working on an R script that is now uh, 3,000 lines long that has all of your dissertation research in it. If so, stop, stop doing that. Figure out ways to write functions and then call the functions and write unit tests to test your functions so that you know that, that they're working as intended. Automate your drudge work. Um, and finally, prove it. Make artifacts and understand impact. So if I can just impart one thing from you, from, uh, to you uh, through this session, it's that if you're interested in, um, in, in this sort of line of work, make sure that you can show people your work. Make sure that's very, very important. It's nice to say I learned Python. It's a lot better to say, look at all these uh, contributions that I have to NLTK. It's very easy to sit there and sit through an introduction of Python class. It's much more difficult to go and contribute to a software package, right? But one will show people that you know what you're talking about, and others is kind of like, eh, well, maybe they know something about Python. Maybe they don't. Who knows? Um, so I think that that's where I, I've stopped here. Um, but I thank you for your time. And we have about 10 minutes left for questions. Hi, Chris. Um, Hi. Thanks again. So I was just wondering, for those of us who have taken like a compositional semantics course, 
um, what kind of keywords, how can we parlay that into relevant language that um, you know, people in these companies would understand what we actually worked on? Uh, from a computational semantics course? Is that what Compositional semantics. Compositional semantics. Seems um, like it's very I, familiar. I don't know like about compositional semantics. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, that's okay. I think it's very related. It's like you know, yeah, yeah. identification and everything. So, okay. Yeah. Well, um, well, well. Um, so one thing I could I think that compositional semantics is about is um, ontologies. Presumably, you've worked on ontologies and embeddings and things like that. Maybe a little bit. Okay. So that that's kind of the currency of the realm in natural language understanding. So natural language understanding is kind of the um, province of like the digital personal assistants and things like that, right? So if I tell my um, uh, whatever Google Home or or you know uh, Alexa or whatever, um, uh, I love my mom. Why don't we call her now? Well, you you know you need it, some sort of representation, an ontology that says mom is referred to as her, or, you know whatever, however you want to envision it. So natural language understanding is a good and, and has the sort of um, had a benefit of that it's it's a very hot field right now. Um, they're hiring lots and lots and lots and lots of linguists to make lots and lots and lots and lots of ontologists. Um, so that's one keyword you can you can look for is ontology. Yeah. I wish I knew more about compositional uh, semantics. I'm not yeah, I think it's like very helpful for it um, for doing for tr translation into uh, working with computational because there's um, you know we use lambda lambda functions in order to like right. figure out how interrelated everything. So I think it's pretty close. Great. We have a couple of questions in the chat. First, would you suggest to put academic output together with side projects on our website? Uh, yeah, for sure, definitely. Um, yeah, there, so there's nothing wrong with um, with talking about what you've done in academia. So my first job uh, outside of academia was in Texas speech um, research and development. And the um, the director of the, the org or whatever that I was joining sort of said, yeah, send me all your you know academic articles. I'd love to read them. And then I turned up for the interview and he said, oh, thank you for coming. By the way, I didn't read any of your articles. So, you know, um, don't expect that people are going to read, you know, seven 50 page articles because you're interviewing with them. They're not. Um, but there's nothing wrong with putting um, the fact that you wrote an article that's in language or, you know, Journal of Sociolinguistics or whatever um, on your website. It certainly is impressive. I mean, it points that you can, you know, you can make deliverables, um, but it's probably not realistic to expect everyone to read all of your articles. It's just not how industry works. Um, your next question, is it necessary to learn Python, Python for NLP work? I've done some Java at beginner level. Can I use that? Uh, yeah, it's, def it's certainly not necessary to, to learn Python. Um, Python is nice because it's very simple. It's a scripting language, a high level scripting language. So it has the benefit of being relatively easy to read um, compared to Java, which I'll be honest, I look at Java and I think public class, this public class, I have no idea what all that stuff means and it's hard to follow. So if you've already done Java, uh, Python should be a piece of cake. Um, so yeah, it's, it's certainly not necessary to learn Python for NLP work. Great, next question. In your experience, are there opportunities to work on these kinds of projects with a team strictly as a linguist without having coding knowledge? Yeah, I get this question all the time. Do I need to know how to code? And, and you know the, the the truth is you don't need to know how to code, but if you are not willing to interact with, so you, if you want to work with engineers, so if you're going to work in tech, you're going to work on a team, you're going to work with engineers. There are engineers and every the engineers are the ones who actually do the stuff. They write the code that you know makes things work that people use. So if you're not willing to engage with the ideas in code and you sort of throw your hands up you're gonna make a rod for your own back. So you don't have to strictly speaking know how to code, but it is always going to help you. It will never, ever, ever hurt you to know how to write code. And generally speaking, you don't have to know it, but it, it will always help you. The next question asks, where would I go to look for side projects for linguistic annotation that might be a few hours per week? 
Yeah, so this is a great question. I mean, I don't, I don't really know. I've not done it, but um, at the question, the, the companies that I've worked at, we hi we contracted with um, with vendors who sourced uh, or who hired um, people who did the annotations. So when I was at Nuance, I think that we worked with Appen, which is either was Appen Butler Hill or is now Appen Butler Hill. So that's one. Um, Lionbridge, I know, does this too. Um, and there are a variety of companies that that do this sort of thing. And the next person would like to know the name of the statistical learning book that you mentioned earlier in your presentation. Yeah, so the, the, the authors of that book are Hasty and Tib Sharani. And the book is called Introduction to Statistical Learning. And that's sort of the, 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 um, the nice reader friendly part. There is also one called Elements of Statistical Learning that is much more in depth. Um, could you or someone else add to the chat? Add that to the chat. So yeah, Introduction to Statistical Learning. And next question, will linguists become more or less relevant in the future of NLP? This is a great question. I mean, I don't, I don't have a crystal ball and obviously don't really know. Um, but I think that the, I think as, as NLP ventures into more and more uncharted territory, um, linguists will become more and more relevant because linguists understand how humans use language, right? And that's, that's kind of our, um, our superpower. And you know, the more we get into difficult questions uh, of, um, of language and wanting to model that, the more linguist uh, skills, linguistic, uh, linguistic skill set will be valuable. So I, my prediction is more, but it's a probabilistic thing. I don't really know, right? Uh, the last question that's in the chat at the moment is, oops, I missed it. Um, I'm a linguist and I'm learning data science. How can I make sure that my new knowledge of data science makes me eligible for jobs in computational linguistics at companies like Google? Um, how can I make sure that my knowledge, my new knowledge of data science makes me eligible? Well, um, I, so, I mean, uh, to some extent, like this, this distinction that I've made here between um, natural language processing data science and human language technology is artificial. So you have data people whose job title is data scientists that work um, on language things and people that do human language technology who are engineers who don't really know anything about linguistics. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to say is if you are learning about building models and being uh, statistical models and being sophisticated about using data, uh, then there's no way that your, your work here can not make you um, uh, competitive for jobs or not making more competitive, more eligible for jobs in fields like computational linguistics at companies like Google. And next question, any exciting projects you're working on right now? Any suggestions for YouTube channels or Twitch channels for watching coding live streams? Um, so I can't really talk that much about what I'm working on now. It's, it's highly proprietary, um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I can tell you that I work in the ads org, which is probably the most profitable machine on the face of the earth right now. Um, so that's kind of interesting. Um, suggestions for YouTube channels. Um, I don't know. I'm old. I read books. Uh, and Twitch, I, I almost don't even know what that is. So I, I can't claim to be really au courant. And we have a hand from Wei, Wei Lai. Hi, Chris. Um, Hi. I enjoy your talk very much, so thank you for the talk. I'm wondering, because you mentioned that you come from, you are doing um, jobs that are related to voice in the first place, and then you switch to Google and other places that might deal with text as well. So I am a phonetician, and I am wondering what are the, uh, how is the job opportunities look like how, how do they look like for um, speech scientists versus um, NL, um, uh, natural language processing side of um, the linguistic um, opportunities, linguistic work, job opportunities? Mm -hmm. Well, so speech science is, is great because it gives you a lot of experience with um, kind of the more technical aspects of, of language. And yeah, if you want to work in a, in a field like text to speech synthesis, you're going to be working on that all the time, or ASR, automatic speech recognition. You're going to be working on that all the time. So it's just, it's a little bit different kind, you know, sort of work. But um, in terms of are there more or less jobs? 
Mm, that's kind of hard to say. It's really, really difficult to say which one has more jobs. So we have about two more questions to get through. We are at time. Uh, the next question, any introductory material you can re recommend oops, for anyone interested in learning about these topics? So yeah, that the book that I mentioned, um, Introduction to Statistical Learning, is, is a great first stop. Um, there is a, so the, the software package that I mentioned, the Natural Language Toolkit, NLTK, is all open source, and it has a book that's all online um, for free. Um, it only demands your time and attention. Um, there is, in addition, there are a number of good textbooks, one uh, written by um, a guy named Jacob Eisenstein, who used to be at uh, Georgia Tech and is now at Google, um, who just came out with a new book on um, natural language processing and intro to natural language processing. I, I had to confess, I don't know the title, but I'm sure if you look up Jacob Eisenstein uh, book, Natural Language Processing, it'll pop right up. Um, so there's, yeah, there's a lot of nice introductory material. But keep in mind that it is, it's not always written for, you know, I, um, for people who are not technical. Not, sometimes it is, but, you know, don't be scared if you see, you know, numbers and, and equations and things like that. Just try and wade through it, you know, do your best to understand what you can. And our last question, or at least our last question right now, how relevant is a graduate degree for NLP slash computational linguistics work in tech? Yeah, so I get this question question a lot too. Um, and uh, so sort of the, the market reality is that, um, is that it, you know, if, if a company can afford to pay someone who has an undergrad degree and a grad degree, the same salary, which one will they hire? Obviously, they're going to hire the person with a graduate degree, right? Um, you know, if you can have like a crappy car and a really nice car for the same price, you'll get the nice car, almost invariably, right? So, you know, the, don't forget that these these fields obey market forces, and so the the applications within natural language processing and human language technology and all that that are hiring the most people will be the ones that are the most profitable. And if you want to. Um, you know, it's not the case that you need a, a graduate degree to work in, in NLP or computational linguistics, but it is the case that you need a skill set that will allow you to work in it. And it is the case that there is unfortunately a glut of linguistics knowledge in the world and, you know, not that many jobs. And so, um, you know, the, just keep that in mind. You know, it's, it's important to remember to be realistic about, you know, sort of the, the job market. All right, I think those those were all of the questions for okay. you, so. Thank you for your time. Have a great day.